Hello, everybody, and welcome to Books in Hindsight. I am your host, author, Matthew Hines. Today, we have an amazing guest. We have the lovely Angie Chuang with us, and she's going to talk about her book, The Four Words for Home, a memoir of two families. It's going to be an exciting show, but before we bring Angie out here, we need to take care of some business. First of all, we want to point out that we have some lovely new t-shirt designs in our uh, Books in Hindsight logo. And as you can see, we have the podcast guest. We have the Born to Read model. We have the signature model. And of course, we have the producer model for our Patreon sponsors. So it is really a fantastic time to be a member of Books in Hindsight. And if you're not, hit that subscribe button. All right, then. Without further ado, let's bring out Angie. Let's go to the phones. Hindsight is always 2020. And we explore the great books, works, and ideas of the century. Now, here's your host, teacher, and author, Matthew Hines. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Books in Hindsight. As I promised you, I have author and journalist Angie Chuang. She's waiting for us right now, and we're going to talk to her in just a second, but I want to remind everybody her book is Four Words for Home, a memoir of two families, and you can look at her personal information on her website, AngieChuang.com, and I'm going to spell that for you, A-N-G-I-E-C-H-U-A-N-G.com. So, Angie Chuang, welcome to Books in Hindsight. Thank you, Matt. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Yeah, and we're really happy to have you because you have an amazing experience to talk about. You have an amazing book to talk about, and it is all so topical. So let's not waste any time. Um, Let's uh, get started with uh, a couple of questions, and we're going to kind of structure this interview where I would actually like to talk you to talk about your professional and your education background before we talk about your family background. So can you explain to us a little bit about your education and uh, what you got into after college? Yeah, yeah, we were uh, just sharing uh, Pac-10, Pac-12 stories, but I, um, I am definitely an alum of um, the Pac-10, and uh, I um, went to Stanford University, studied English literature, got my master's as well, and um, like many English majors, came out of my education and wondered how I was going to earn a paycheck, and luckily, I had spent a lot of time at the student newspaper and really had grown to love journalism for its emphasis on writing, but also on people and all the people I got to meet and interview. And so that sort of became my ticket into both uh, paycheck, rent, (laughs) food, and also um, a really great career that brought me to the experiences that became the topic of my book and have continued to pay off with great material. So I worked as a daily newspaper journalist for almost 15 years out of my um, grad school and um, wound up at the Oregonian for the longest period of my um, career, which I know is just south of you, um, in Portland. And at the Oregonian, um, wrote about race issues, immigration, uh, immigrant communities, refugee communities which in 2000 was a very different thing than it was by September 2001. So um, that's what sort of led me to the book project that um, we're talking about today. 
and then made a switch in 2007 to academia. So now I teach journalism and I've taught at a couple of different universities, uh, American University in Washington, D.C. And I'm currently at University of Colorado Boulder um, in Boulder, Colorado. I, I'm currently in Denver, uh, which is where I live. And so, and I still write, I still do journalism on a freelance sort of more long form at my own pace basis. But um, my love for nonfiction and journalism have continued even as um, I uh, have been teaching it more of the time than I've been practicing it. All right. Well, let's go all the way back to the first thing you talked about. And that was, we were talking about um, being members of the PAC 12. And, you know, I'm so old school, I'm going to get it mixed up and say PAC 10. And sorry for that. But I just, uh, when I, when I got uh, Angie on the, um, onto Zoom here, the first thing I wanted to point out was my uh, Washington State University um, logo. And this is the only garment I have where that would show up during the podcast. I just wanted to rub that in because you're, uh, you're obviously teaching with the Colorado Buffaloes and you are a graduate of Stanford. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't say this, but I'm very impressed by graduates of Stanford. And so uh, that's a, another a reason I wanted to get you on the podcast. It's like... Uh, I, I'm very impressed by graduates of Stanford too. I've gone back to teach and I'm blown away by the current students there now. And, um, you know, um, sometimes sometimes surprised. Uh, sometimes I forget that I was there too when I when I go on campus now. Yeah. Okay. Sure, Angie. And I'm sure it's been that long that, that you wouldn't remember yes. what it was <laughs> like. Uh, I would I would put it at five uh, at the most. Oh, you're 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 you're, you're too kind. I'm yes. um, I'm looking at my uh, 25 re- year re- reunion soon, so uh, it has been. Oh, right. now there's all right. Now there's a credibility issue here, but we're just going to have to continue on. Uh, Angie, um, you wrote for a couple other papers. You, I have you at the Hartford. Is that current? Current. Current. Okay. Yeah, it probably is more correct to say current, but um, people in Hartford say current. Yeah, and it's Connecticut, so you just never know. And uh, I I hope at least it's Connecticut. At least my geography is. It is is very much Connecticut. And you also wrote for the LA Times. Yeah, I did. I did. I was part of a program there called the uh, Minority Editorial Training Program, which I believe still exists in some form. But at the time I joined, you would spend a year at the LA Times on staff and they would ship you out to another uh, Times Mirror back then. Uh, Now it's, uh, well, no, Los Angeles Times is no longer Tribune. It was Tribune for a while and now it is owned by the... um, billionaire who saved the LA Times from uh, bad corporate ownership, in my mind. So it's uh, currently seeing better days. But at the time, the deal was that you would go to one of the papers in the chain. And um, I very much wanted to work on the East Coast. And so Hartford was uh, where I got posted. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit then about your... Uh, your your professional experience, and um, I, I would like to. Uh, well, I, this is kind of um, something that we're going to have to. I'd like to stay away from it as much as possible. But there's an issue that you write about, and that is about race in America. And while you're talking about working at the Oregonian, you said that that was that's where you kind of got inspired um, to write your book, The Four Words for Home. So. Um, could you just uh, elaborate a little bit about what motivated you then uh, to write your book? Yeah, it, it was a very interesting process because I was hired by the Oregonian to cover a new reporting beat or specialty on race issues. And this was, um, I think, Portland realizing that it was changing and that the current staff didn't necessarily look like the newcomers that were populating, uh, now populating the Portland metro area. And they were very much in the market for somebody who had an interest and experience with um, both uh, people of color and immigrant communities, uh, not always the same people, and to really um, document the Oregon that was becoming 
a, a different place. And um, I thought it was really exciting. I had not spent a lot of time in Oregon. Um, I had grown up in the San Francisco Bay Area, so I was used to a very racially diverse community and had been interested in, um, in those issues. And so I applied for the job, I got the job, and as I settled in for my first year, my editors and I were absolutely confident that the big story for the new millennium was going to be um, uh, Latinx immigration. So um, mostly Mexican, Central American, moving into Oregon, people who had come for um, migrant labor, farm jobs, who were now settling and bringing families and really changing the entire population and bringing a lot of really exciting culture. Like most people's first experience with that population was like, oh, wow, there's really good taquerias now. We can, we can get good food. But it was so much more than that. So I was brushing up my Spanish and we were talking about that. And I remember I had this big story come out on September 10th, 2001 in the Oregonian. And the story was about um, people from primarily Mexico who had received um, immigration amnesty in the 1980s. And George W. Bush at the time uh, was talking with Vicente Fox about um, creating a new amnesty act and giving more uh, primarily Mexican immigrants amnesty. So I talked to maybe three different people who had been beneficiaries of amnesty. And one had become a very successful professional, worked for the state, was a leading political activist, um, you know, living a very upper middle class life. Uh, one was um, a guy who had um, raised, helped raise Christmas trees at a farm and was still doing the same job, uh, you know, 15, 20 years later, had not significantly changed his life. And so that came out, I, um, there were a couple other people, and my editor and I said, well, that was a good project. Let's talk tomorrow about how we're going to expand on this, and we might send you to Latin America, we might um, do a lot more of this. So that was September 10th. And we never had our meeting because everything changed. And so about a week after September 11th, we were scrambling and trying to figure out what Oregon and the West Coast had to do with um, this disaster that had happened very far from us. And um, it became clear that we were likely going to bomb Afghanistan, that this was the narrative that was coming forward. So my editor at the time, the same one who had scheduled the meeting that never happened, uh, came to my desk and said, I want you to find the human face for the country we're about to bomb. And it's a kind of jarring way to talk about what journalists do, but that is what journalists do. So from that point on, I knew my job was to find somebody or somebody's with ties to Afghanistan, who could help illuminate or explain what the human cost and the human dynamics of a war that we were about to enter. So that's what I did, basically. Okay, and so um, the four words for home that that covers uh, Afghanistan. Yes. Yes. So, um, you mean the um, the actual title or the book or the story? The, 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 the and it, what what does the forwards for home? So that doesn't because and I guess I should have asked you just to go into your own family's um, background, but but I guess that's not really the point because. Um, w- so explain to us a little bit more about what uh, the book is more about Afghanistan then. A little bit, but it also covers my family. But the title itself does refer to um, language in Afghanistan. And uh, I had worked really, really hard to learn as much Pashto, which is not the official language of Afghanistan, but is spoken by more of the people in the South and the Pashtun ethnic group, which was really the focus of the war because the Taliban are essentially, they're not synonymous with Pashtuns, but they were uh, largely made up of that ethnic group. And the family I was traveling with spoke that language. So in Pashto, if you look up a Pashto English dictionary for the word home, it gives you four separate words. So they can't, they can't 
uh, define home in one word. And so there's one word for house and one word for your country, one word for your birthplace, and then one word that means more or less like motherland or fatherland. And I thought that was fascinating because it was really the linguistic story of how a population had been forced to move, migrated, um, displaced, um, you know, national boundaries had changed and that people needed multiple words to sort of describe, well, not that home, but that home, right? Yeah, so that is so interesting. So now, Angie, let's go into your um, experience because, you know, I'm sure that people listening to this are already fascinated by your story and your book. But um, what about what about your own family? What was what was their experience, and how does that relate, if at all, to the book? Yeah. So basically, I started writing the book just about the family from Afghanistan and about my time in Afghanistan as a journalist, but as I lived with this family for um, several weeks, it became difficult to just be a journalist. They started treating me like a family member, which is wonderful, inevitable, and really the best way to learn about another culture and country. But it also took me out of a journalist role. And so it was really necessary for me to do the journalism I had set out to do, but also to write this book that allowed me to be um, an I in the book, an embodied person. In journalism, we don't use the first person. We don't say I unless it's an opinion piece. So as I put the I in the story, just to explain simple conversations and inter- interactions I had with the people I was actually living with in Kabul and outside of Kabul, um, people who were reading my stories, I had published um, kind of um, excerpts of of thing, pieces that became chapters. Um, or I would workshop it with other writers. The question kept coming up, well, tell me more about you. I said, oh, no, no, this book is not about me. I'm a journalist. I don't, I don't write about myself. They said, well, clearly your family has some interesting connections to the word home and immigration and migration. And the more people asked, the more I realized I needed to put some of that history in. So just little by little, I'm like, oh, one chapter. I'll put in one chapter about my family. They're like, oh, that's not enough. And it became, it's less than, I would say about 40% of the book. It's um, definitely less than half, but it's a significant part of the book. And I start the um, first chapter after the prologue with the moment that um, I was packing to go to Kabul. Um, I had uh, already planned the trip in 2004. So it took, it took a few years covering this family to plan this trip. And um, my mother, who um, is a first generation immigrant from Taiwan, who is ethnically Chinese, as is my father, called me and said, I didn't want to bother you before this trip, but I need to tell you I'm divorcing your father. But I don't worry about it. Just go on your trip. But I just wanted you to know. And this had been after a long process by which after my parents immigrated to the United States before I was born, I was born in San Francisco. My father came from Taiwan for graduate school at um, UC Berkeley, which is where my my uh, Pac-10 uh, roots started in the 60s. And so this was really common. Uh, Berkeley and a lot of um, major universities recruited many, many engineering students from Taiwan. So my father came for that. He went back home, met and married my mother, I think probably on school breaks, and then brought her upon his graduation. And they, they married in Taiwan, started a new life in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was born a few years, a couple years later. And um, we, uh, my brother born three years after that. And we grew up in a bilingual uh, Mandarin, Chinese, and English household. I went to regular public school and went to Chinese school on the weekends. Uh, had many, many friends, and um, my parents had many friends who were immigrants from Taiwan, and that was the community I was raised in. Um, well, Angie, can I can I just ask you a question here? As an immigrant, I mean, to me, it sounds like. 
you you had the same childhood I, I did. Um, I grew up up here in a wide little town, not San Francisco, but uh, you know, it sounds like we kind of had similar upbringing, ex- except my you know my parents were from the U.S. and and we've been here for a while. But I mean, how did you, did you ever really come to a point where somebody said? that you're, you, you're different, you're an immigrant. Uh, did, did that, did that happen to you? Um, yeah, yeah. I think it was a combination of both being inside an enclave like community where we were all aware that the reason why we were all in Chinese school and socializing with each other was because we were different than the other people we went to school with. We were having. Well, why, why was the, where, who, who made the difference? Was it because, um, you know, like uh, I'll take one example. In I, uh, when you were in um, Afghanistan, I was down in Oman, mm-hmm. and I, I was teaching college down there. And um, Indians that work in Oman, they do not want they they are separate. They have separate schools. Uh, they have a separate culture, and it's because they choose that. Um, mm-hmm. and they, they don't want their kids to go into the Omani schools. And I think it's, it's a mutual, um, thing, but, um, when you grew up was, um, what did, did, who, who accentuated that we have a different culture? Was it the outsider or was it from within? Was it within your own culture? I mean, that's a really complicated question. I think it's important to remember that my parents arrived in the United States. My father arrived in 63 and until 64 segregation by race was legal and they were maybe a generation removed from a time when it was okay to completely exclude Chinese from the United States because they were threatening the jobs of white Americans. Uh, This was the years in which uh, Vincent Chin, a Detroit auto worker, was beaten to death because the other white auto workers thought he was Japanese and perceived him as a threat. Uh, My parents did, um, my father entered into um, a graduate school in a work world where um, a change in immigration policy had brought large numbers of Asian immigrants and they were constantly being told in one way or another that you're taking the jobs from qualified white people. They like you because you're docile and you'll work for less money and you'll work longer hours. And we're going to make sure that you don't get to sit in the lunchroom with us. And yes, there were language barriers and cultural barriers. And I think there's choice on both sides of it. But I think any um, any um, hyphenated community in the United States is usually built out of a combination of shared qualities and a desire to be together and a, a common experience of exclusion and discrimination. It's, um, it's often difficult to, to um, separate the two from each other. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I don't know much about the culture of Oman, but I imagine the Indian community there probably face certain discrimination and exclusion as well. I know in um, it, a lot of the characters in my book were raised in Pakistan. And in Pakistan, it was forbidden. The school system did not allow Afghans to go to Pakistani schools. Yeah. So they all went to Afghan schools that were formed by Afghan people and were quite isolated in Pakistan. But that was, you know, that was the... Um, that was the country that they lived in's policy. Uh, luckily, the United States didn't do that, but I think there was a desire for our parents to, they weren't part of the PTA. The PTA doesn't, didn't reach out to parents whose first language wasn't English. So they got to be active in the weekend Chinese school and sort of build that for their children as well. Okay. Well, I will tell you that is all very eye-opening um, to me, because, you know, one thing that you, you find, especially today, is that when you talk about race, it's such a loaded topic that people can't really um, sit and, and and talk about their own experiences. And, you know, it's, uh, I grew up in, a, my wife is actually from India. And um, so I I know all about Indian culture. And I know that there's a lot of racism, like, 
everywhere. And, um, and, and that definitely, the, 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 the situation in Oman is definitely due to a racist and uh, a religious, in, in some ways, um, environment. And, and then there's also, like, if you talk about Afghanis, they don't trust uh, people from Pakistan, right? And, um, and so there's all this mystery. I mean, I, I, that's, it, that's a broad brush statement, I think. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I, the only reason I'm doing, I'm giving you this secondhand, uh, from right. my life. So in, in Pakistan, I mean, I would say that the family that I wrote about, um, many of their close, close friends were Pakistani. Like I would go to dinner at their house and, you know, their Pakistani friends would be there and they would be kind of laughing about, oh, our food is so similar or, or um, our cultures are so similar. Yeah. And so there was not, I don't think there was a universal animosity, okay. but back in Pakistan, much like we're seeing in Europe now, there was a feeling of this refugee population is going to overwhelm our resources. And we don't like that a war that we uh, don't have anything to do with, or multiple wars that we don't have anything to do with, have driven all these people across the border needing resources from us when. We don't have that much. I mean, it's all sounding a little familiar, right? Yeah. We don't have all that much to provide our own people. And so we're going to shut them out. So we're not, we're not providing an incentive for more refugees to come. Yeah. And so those well, and, yeah and you're, you're sophisticated enough to understand this. It is a, it is a cycle where the people who produce weapons sell the weapons, people use the weapons, they create the refugee crisis, and they have to go live someplace else because of the people that sold the weapons. And you saw that in Afghanistan, and I'm sure they don't let you report on that stuff because I'm sure that your paper is owned by somebody who owns, uh, you know, has a share in Raytheon or, uh, you know, the, the people who make tanks or, or weapons or whatever, but that seems to be the vicious cycle is these wars create refugees and the wars are just about selling weapons. And if you didn't sell the weapons, you probably wouldn't have all these wars. But, um, okay, so let's go back to this uh, statement I made about the um, Afghanis and the Pakistanis. Now, my wife is from Delhi, and she talks about the Afghanis as the most wonderful, kindest uh, people that you want to meet. But because of the animosity with with uh, Pakistan and India, then, you know, my, my wife obviously has a, um, a tainted uh, view of, of um, Pakistan. And um, if people in India don't like Pakistan, then I guess my wife would assume other uh, other people don't like them as well. But, um, you know, one thing about Oman I just want to add here, and this I, I wrote a book, I wrote a couple of books about Oman, but it is the one place in the world where all nationalities get together. I mean, there's no animosity and the government really goes out of its way to include the Indians and the Chinese and anybody who's there, the Americans, whoever's there, they really try to include um, everybody in their culture and they do that as part of their religion. So uh, that's why I, th I found fascinating about Oman and, and why I lived there for so long and wrote books about it. But let's talk about your, um, let's talk about your um, book. Um, so your family's experience you've included in your book. Yes, yes, it is. Um, it's sort of woven throughout where I describe what's happening in my family while I'm traveling in Afghanistan, which is essentially the breakdown of okay. my parents' and, marriage. And Angie, that late in time, are they still being affected by, you know, issues of race and, and being from a different culture? Is that still happening or, or is, is this mostly about the divorce and, and people setting up new lives? Well, I, I, I think there's definitely cultural elements. I think that... Um, I describe a lot about, I describe it as sort of the American dream gone wrong, right? That um, so much is invested in the idea of a family or I think in my father's generation, a man coming to the U.S. to study from a poor family and really becoming the sole source of support. And my father suffered from mental illness. He was bipolar. He manifested it later in his life. He was not uh, visibly ill when I was first growing up, but or when I was very young. But as he got older, and really as he got sort of frustrated by his career for the reasons I alluded to, there was a lot of 
I think um, sometimes outright, but often hidden or subtle discrimination where he would complain a lot about at the government lab he worked at in California, um, every manager was white and every uh, Chinese immigrant employee, uh, this probably included Indian immigrants and other groups as well, would rise up to a certain level and not get promoted. And so things like that happening, um, differences in pay, um, you know, um, things like that, um, differences in how vacation time was doled out. And so he became very, very frustrated with his career and sort of up and quit his job. And that was sort of the beginning of his illness. And I think there are a lot of cultural aspects of not wanting to call mental illness what it is. Um, there was a feeling that um, Chinese people don't have mental illnesses. They just like have weak characters, right? Americans like to talk about depression and that kind of stuff, but that doesn't, that doesn't happen to Chinese people. Um, it's just your failure to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, um, and um, get past it. And so he never really acknowledged it. And so this became the wedge that sort of broke the marriage down. And so I think there were a lot of cultural aspects to that and the pressure of being the one family member from his family who came to the United States, got the scholarship, got the um, nice American life and had to support his, his family members. So Angie, um, just a, a quick question. Do you, do you think that the pressures that he faced added to his, the, the level of severity of his, of his bipolarism? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, um, pretty well documented that if you have a predisposition for mental illness, um, that any, any external sources of stress will definitely, um, trigger, worsen, complicate, um, complicate what's, you know, what, what's happening. Okay. So where is Angie and at what time, uh, because we, I asked you this before, but um, now your father has, uh, he has bipolar disorder. Um, obviously, things are not happy at home. So where does Angie, uh, do you hear what's going on at your father's work? When, when um, yeah, there? yeah. I mean, I think I'm aware this is happening. Around the time I was in high school, he left his job very suddenly and entered into a long period of what we now know was depression. Okay, but did, did, you know, did you know he was facing discrimination at work based on yeah. his, his yeah. nationality? Yeah, and, he would talk about it. Yeah. I, mean, what, yeah. I was 13, 14, so I didn't process it in quite the same way that I do now, but I remember him talking about it. And so so I, I, I hate that. I hate when reporters ask this question, but I'm, I'm in a corner here, so I have to ask it. So how does that make you feel? I mean, you're a kid. And and suddenly you realize that I'm going to be singled out because I'm I'm different. How does how did that make you feel? And and, and it, it, that wasn't a discovery I made at 13. I think um, the other thing is, as much as we lived, we had an enclave. And we had Chinese schools and communities. Uh, my parents moved us to a largely white suburb, um, and I attended public schools there. And they chose it because the public schools were really good. And they wanted me in that public school system. So at the same time, I was hanging out with all my um, um, immigrant friends from Taiwan. I was going to a school that was largely white. And from the day I stepped into school, I knew I was different. And um, I showed up. Um, I, I grew up speaking English, but my parents were much more. They were told by their older immigrant friends that um, kids will pick up English if they live in the U S and that retaining Chinese is actually the harder skill. So they were not, they, uh, they made sure I went to preschool and learned English, but they spoke a lot of Chinese to me at home. And when I entered kindergarten, um, I had just come off, um, a trip to Taiwan. So I had been for a month, I had been speaking to everybody in Chinese and I showed up at the kindergarten and just started speaking to all my teachers in Chinese because I thought, of course, this is how I, this is, oh, they sent me to, um, to summer kindergarten in Taiwan. So in my mind, I was like, oh, you speak to your teachers in Chinese. This is just what you do. And they promptly sent me to speech therapy, even though I didn't need it. 
because it didn't it didn't occur to them she might be speaking a different language because she just came back from Taiwan and her parents are immigrants. And so here I was stuck in speech therapy. I'm like, I don't belong here. And so from that, from those early experiences, it was clear I I was never not aware of some level of difference or discrimination. It wasn't a shock to me that my father was experiencing it. Um, I think processing it as, as a systemic issue came later when I studied race, wrote about it, became a journalist, focused on those issues. Man, I'm telling you, I'm I am shocked by this. Um, I just okay, so I'll just give you my own experience, just so you can kind of compare. I grew up in a small town in Washington State, and um, we were homogenous, all white kids. And in this is back in the '80s. I I won't tell you which end, but uh, we got the um, Vietnamese refugees started uh, coming in, right? And for us, it was like, oh, great, somebody knew. And these guys had, they didn't speak English that well, but they really had great stories to tell about Vietnam. So, you know, I, I you know, when I, when I hear things like this, um, I, I don't know, I don't know what, uh, what, it, what makes people um, do these kinds of things, but uh, I, I guess it was, for us, it was, oh, great, somebody knew and, and they can tell us something that, that we don't already know. And, and they were all really cool kids. And um, so um, I, I, I really uh, feel horrible that uh, that happened to you. So then I have to ask you about um, your family came to the United States with expectations. And, you know, your father had expectations of education and working. and um, were were his expectations what he did he find what he wanted? No, clearly not. I mean, I think that's that's the reason for the illness and the divorce. And I think in juxtaposing his story with the Afghan family story, the um, the sort of um, core story that sparked the book. What I w- also wanted to show was that. Um, the Afghan family initially started, um, the first member of the family came to the U.S. also um, at the same time, around the same time my father did, to pursue an education. He uh, studied at Stanford and, um, and had really high hopes that he would go back to Kabul and support his family and, and help everybody out there. And then the war interrupted. And his brother was killed. Um, and he um, then had to rescue his other two brothers and get them out of Afghanistan so they wouldn't be killed too. And this was the beginning of the Soviet war um, when um, the communists were taking over. And his entire life changed because he became essentially an immigrant who became a refugee, right? So he really kind of transitioned from one category to the other. And it was a sort of, in, he called it his involuntarily, ex, his involuntary exile. And so that's sort of where his story and my father's story diverged, where he had to make all these choices that weren't part of his plan because of war in his country. Whereas my father stuck to his plan, but then um, wasn't able to fulfill his American dream as he, as he envisioned it. So, you know, different outcomes, different paths. But um, I think that, um, you know, the path, like when you talk about the Vietnamese refugees who came, their experience is so different than my family's because it's different to say, I am going to go to graduate school in America because this is a great opportunity for my family and I'm curious about the world and would like to travel versus somebody is bombing my country. And if I don't get out of here, I will either be dead or stuck in a re-education camp and tortured. So I'm just going to take the first place that will take me and have without any preparation or any, um, you know, real um, choice in the matter. And that's a very, very different experience. And so even in this Afghan family for the oldest brother to come to America willingly, and then his other families members to come and join him to really preserve their lives was a very different experience between, between them as well. Okay. So um, you kind of are talking about almost somebody that feels like they're trapped 
Could your father have just picked up and said, I've had enough of this and, and gone back to Taiwan? Was um, that an option or did he ever talk about that? I, I didn't hear him talk about it. I think that would have been incredibly uprooting for us. I think probably if, if only because of the two of us um, who had really been born in the country and were very assimilated there, it wouldn't have made sense for him. Uh, there are people in his generation who have eventually made their way back because they still feel more comfortable there. There's nationalized healthcare there. Um, you know, they had opportunities there. Um, I think for him, that was never really seen as an option, partially because of the family, but also because he, um, for all the frustration he had, he really loved America. and He really talked about his love, I, I uh, allude to this in the book several times, uh, his love for American food. He talked about how much he loved hamburgers. He um, loved national parks and he took us to all these national parks. So he really had an affinity for the country. It was just his um, career and things like that that didn't work out for him. Yeah. And also, Angie, I would just have to throw in, I, I don't know if you've picked this out yet, but look at you. I mean, I, if I was your father, I would be of everything that went wrong. Look what re- went went right. You know, you got an education. Look what you're doing now. Um, you're a beautiful person. Would you have had all, any of those happen to you if you guys had stayed back in Taiwan? I mean, it's rhetorical. I mean, it's, it's that, was, I mean that, that was the, um, that was sort of the message we had growing up was that your parents sacrificed for you. You owe it to them to get a good education to be, to be like, you know, good second generation immigrant kids. I don't, I don't think I'm unique in having had those pressures or having been both positively and negatively influenced by those pressures. But I think, you know, the positive, I think the narrative of the Asian model minority is, um, you know, one of those double-edged stereotypes where people say like, well, what's wrong with being a model minority? And I think what happens is it overlooks the issue that this was a population that was pre-programmed to succeed. That if you create immigration policies that say we only want people who come for education, who have certain skills, who have a baseline of a certain amount of income uh, guaranteed, and we're bringing you to the country specifically to get a graduate degree and work in a certain field, for all the obstacles my father faced, that's a very different story than a Vietnamese refugee who's completely displaced and thrown out of a war into a situation where they might get to work in a restaurant if they're lucky. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, model minority stereotypes are tricky because it also overlooks that Asians are not a monolith and that the story of um, Chinese Americans who came like my father is a very different path than say a Hmong refugee from Laos who came out of, um, Nixon's secret war. And so, um, yeah, so I think we all really felt like we benefited from our parents' choices and, and their work, but we were reminded of that every day. It was not a, it was not a subtle message to say, you better, you better bust your asses because, Okay. Now, you know, you lived in Afghanistan, and that's a little bit different country than Oman, but I, for myself, um, and I've lived in Oman and Saudi Arabia, and, you know, you hear all these terrible things about Saudi Arabia, but it's not that bad of a country to live in, and it's fairly, it's safer than the U.S. Um, Oman is very safe, and um, they have a very, a very high standard of living, and so I look at people that immigrate here now, and I, I, because if I had my choice, um, I mean, we've been here five years. We can't even get my wife's citizenship, right? Oh, so you want to yeah. talk about an immigration story there? Um, we've been here. We we did all the right things. We paid thousands of dollars, and we're sitting here for five years, five years later, and we still get these things under review. You're under review, right? She's married yeah. to an American, and yeah, but um, apparently – there's other people that get, um, I, I guess, more favorable treatment. But, but my question is, like with your Afghanistan family, would they prefer to be back in Afghanistan if things were different back there? 
Uh, some of them went back. And so every for each person, it was individual. For the family patriarch, he returned and lives. Uh, he still keeps a place in, in Portland, but he essentially moved his life and his career back to Afghanistan. He felt like it was that was calling to him more than staying in the U.S. And then his other family members stayed in the U.S. and built lives there. Some of his... Um, he didn't have uh, biological children of his own, but he adopted um, his brother, his um, deceased brother's children and um, another brother's children. And so they've gone on to marry and start their own families in the U.S. And uh, some of them married white American people, much to their, um, their family's chagrin, and um, had uh, mixed race children and are... Um, at one, you know, living very much like I did as a child, living a very assimilated life on the one side, but having this very um, vibrant and uh, rich community composed of other Afghan Americans. And so, um, so I, th- you know, I think it varied between all of the family members. And a lot of the book is about how each one was trying to negotiate their relationship with Afghanistan. And in light of the fact that in 2001, for all the very chaotic things that were happening there, the one thing that changed was it became safe and possible again to travel there, live there, work there um, in ways that people really didn't want to attempt or couldn't during Taliban rule. Mm -hmm. And so it suddenly opened up. And the initial reaction was everybody wanted to go back. I want to go back and rebuild. I want to go back and help. I want to go back and move back and reclaim my culture. And then over time, um, everybody kind of reached a different conclusion or, or um, their life took its own turns. Can I ask you a question that, and this has to do with them not wanting to go back, but I talked to um, John DeGraff yesterday. I mm-hmm. Also, he dropped out of the UC Berkeley. So you guys have something, something kind of in common, but, but um, John's big thing is consumerism and how much has consumerism taken over Afghanistan now that the Americans have come in and jacked the prices up of everything? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, well, there's so many different levels of that, but um, one thing that really surprised us was the return of a certain kind of very superficial consumer culture that had been forbidden by the Taliban. And so um, the first businesses that went up were things like um, women's clothing stores, um, kind of um, not very, these are not in the expat, so in the expat district, there was a ton of contracts for hotels and businesses that served um, international contractors. So that was its whole that was an entire economic phenomenon that happened mainly around the expat community. But in the parts of Kabul where um, only locals had hung out, uh, they were building uh, banquet halls and uh, places where people could have weddings. Music was forbidden by the Taliban, uh, secular music. And suddenly everybody was crazy about pop music and wanted to have dance parties because uh, dancing had been forbidden. And so in Uh, We were there for about a month. Um, Part of that was travel time. But probably the one kind of public event we went to the most often was dance parties because everybody wanted to dance and everybody needed clothes to go to the dance parties and wanted to buy music. Um, Movies were back in. And so movie theaters became, they were forbidden by the Taliban. I have um, an entire section of a chapter about the um, Afghan obsession with the movie Titanic and how um, they just love that movie and love the story because a story of a couple divided by class um, differences and being unable to marry each other um, because of that felt totally contemporary to them. To us, it was sort of like an old-fashioned story. But to them, they're like, "This, this is our lives. Like, we are Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio, and we're... Uh, we we totally relate to this. And I think they also, I speculated in the book that they also liked that it wasn't a happy ending because to them having your, your uh, great love destroyed by a disaster felt very real to them that many people had lost loves or 
um, relationships because of some unforeseen disaster. Yeah, that was uh, something that I, I picked up on Arab culture quite quickly. And I thought it was almost juvenile at how they were just preoccupied with love stories. And I mean, cartoons, everything soft and fluffy and not the girls, the boys, too. You know, um, they, the fascination with like the color pink. And, and I was just, you know, you're you're guys, you know, and um it was just so weird to me. But after a while, I said, you know what? This is actually kind of nice because we grew up in a very, like, brutal society. You know, we have brutal sports. We're raised from kids. You you have to be a nerd from pain and PE class. And, um, you know, it's the Spartan uh, ideal, I guess. At least that's what we grew up with. And um, these kids have, I mean, it's all cozy and fluffy and mommy and daddy. And um, so I, I really found that. Uh, refreshing. And I just said, gosh, I, I wonder why we didn't, you know, we didn't get that. And, um, you know, it just has to do with our, our media and our government. So we're going to um, kind of go back to um, uh, your book and, ha- and how to get it, Angie. But how much do you think this has to do with like the racism that you felt and that people f- uh, feel now? How much of this is, and I'm not talking about uh, Trump, I'm talking about uh, villainizing the Japanese, uh, villainizing the Vietnamese, villainizing the Muslims, villainizing a group of people. How much was was were the Chinese uh, victims of the government, um, the government's racism? Yeah, well, I think uh, one of the driving forces of wanting to tell this story was because having been. Um, Really, and I don't I don't say this lightly as somebody who wasn't a huge fan of um, George W. Bush, but I was really inspired by George W. Bush's initial openness to uh, collaboration with Mexico, Mexican immigrants. It was very much a part of who he was before September 11th, and um, many political theorists will um, will have much better um, explanations than I can come up with right now about why he flipped or why he had to flip. And, uh, but I still remember the speeches after September 11th. Um, if, um, if you're not with us, you're with the terrorists, um, uh, the axis of evil, right? The rhetoric that was coming up, the U S Patriot Act, um, uh, all of Ashcroft's, um, the number of people who were swept up, who were full fledged American citizens who had very little to do with terrorism, who were accused of being secret terrorist cells, the amount of suspicion against Muslim Americans. Um, Even in trying to find the family that I wrote about, they were the fourth or fifth family I approached about writing, not a book, but a simple story in the Oregonian. Every other family I approached said, I would talk to you, but my kid's getting bullied in school. Or I know a friend who was the victim of a hate crime. Or I heard that a man in Arizona was shot and killed for wearing a turban and he was Sikh. He wasn't even Muslim. So what chance do I have out there if I publicly tell the world I'm Muslim? And so that was very real at the time. And when I found this family who was very willing to put themselves out there and represent Afghanistan, represent Islam as a religion, um, it was important for me to show the aspects of their lives that most people would find surprising that there was a universality to their existence of, you know, the parents being upset that their daughters wanted to date men who weren't Afghan, right? What, what, what story could be more familiar than that to any parent of, um, of a uh, child, 15 or up, right? Or I don't, I don't know what age kids start dating nowadays, but, you know, and, and, um, and just trying to get at some of these other aspects of life and culture where people would be forced to question their assumptions a little bit and, um, and to understand that um, most Afghans rejected the Taliban as much as the U S did and sort of wished the U S had, not done so much to contribute to its rise in the 80s when they left um, the Soviet war. And so um, to fully understand that, I think, was the way to minimize some of the hate that was happening in some small way, right? 
Yeah, but okay. So I, you know, again, we're going to go back to your level of sophistication and I saw it as, and I went, I saw what was going on with uh, 9-11. And the first thing I thought was, okay, this is a group of people and they're terrorists. So they're basically just, they're just criminals with a political bent. But then it was, oh no, we're going to go attack Afghanistan. <laughs> you know that and they weren't Afghan. Not not a single one was yeah, Afghan. And, but but by that by November I was out of here. I said there is no way. I, I I just said I can't I can't live my life. They're villainizing a whole group of people um, because of something that these people did. And and I as soon as I saw that I'd been to uh, Egypt before in the army and I'd trained in special forces with guys from Egypt and from Saudi. And I know what they, you know, I know what they can do. And I said, there's no way they did that without help. And this is right after it happened. I said, there's no way they could have done that without help. I didn't know you couldn't carry a box cutter on a plane or I didn't know you could. So anyway, I went to Oman. I I, I took a teaching job in a a college on the coast of Oman because it was the first place I could find in the Middle East. And I just wanted to show people that you can't victimize this whole culture because of what probably ended up being what people don't really, you know, think it was. So um, that was why why I kind of ended up there. But I just thought it was horrible that our government was victimizing a, an entire culture. And then at the same time, opening the doors to that culture to come in. And, you know, and, and so then everybody's against them and they don't feel happy here. And people don't feel happy uh, that they're here because we have this, what is it, 19 years now? To, uh, 18 years of a uh, yeah. uh, never ending war. So, mm-hmm. and it goes back again to what I was talking about the arms people sell weapons, they create this crisis. And then um, everybody else has to uh, just lick it up. But you're the journalist, and you have to you have to write stuff about that. So, you know, we're Angie. I wish this could be a, a three or four hour uh, interview, but I, I know you've probably got things to do. And I want to um, just remind people that uh, your book is uh, the Forwards for Home, and it's a memoir of two families. Obviously, it's Angie's family and the family from Afghanistan, and Angie's website is angiechuang.com, and it's A-N-G-I-E-C-H-U-A-N-G dot C-O-M. And Angie is a professor at Colorado, uh, Colorado Uni- University of Colorado, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. like people calling me a University of Washington, so yeah. It is, so, it is the University of Colorado. Is your, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Oh, actually, I wanted to ask you, you got re- awards for this book. What were the awards? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, the book won an independent publisher's bronze medal for um, multicultural nonfiction was the category. And it was a finalist for a couple other um, really nice awards, um, William Soroyan and International Wubery. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was. Um, it's been out since 2014. And it's on the uh, big website that starts with an A, but if people don't want to use that, um, my publisher is Willow Books uh, in Detroit, and they can happily sell you a copy of the book directly as well. It's, it's in a few bookstores, but I imagine your readers come from all over, so um, they just have to check with their local bookstores. Okay, so you're talking about the four words for home. That's right. And also I have that on my website, booksinhindsight.com. It's, I have the affiliate link to the A that, why are you not saying the word, Angie? Is there something? Oh, some, some people just have, especially um, authors and people in the publishing industry have issues with Amazon because it um, has really made it difficult for um, small uh, booksellers, small presses, um, authors to survive yeah. um, so maybe the financial terms are not, um, are not um, appealing let's just put it that way how much do you know about this we could have you back to talk about this because this is the podcast for authors so i am how much- not the expert in that only in knowing that my own experience has been that it's very it's very tough to um have your book carried by amazon and meet your financial um your financial goals because exactly. they yes we all know that yeah. they don't they don't give you the same terms as um as other booksellers and because they can 
nuts. You mean other booksellers as in like Penguin and Random House were... It- Oh, just, um, no, no, the, the book was published by a separate publisher. Amazon does do publishing, but I mean, when you sell your books through Amazon, the terms of the sales are much oh. less friendly to the people who need to make money off of books than um, if I were to go to my local independent bookstore and have them order the book. Well, we're going to have to talk. I did not know that. I'm at the whim of Amazon because everybody's um, at the whim of Amazon and yeah, they charge a lot for your um, for just the base price of your book. I mean, you're automatically locked into something that people probably don't even want to um, pay that much money for. So interesting stuff. Well, if I don't bring you back on for that, I'm going to find something else uh, to bring you back on the podcast for, Angie. So are you going to write another book anytime soon? I, I'm, I'm working on one. And um, when I'll finish it, nobody knows. I'm not a, I'm not a fast... Um, writer of books. I tend to take a long time. So um, maybe in a few years, I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll be ready to, to launch another one, I hope, if things go well. Okay. Now, I have a question that has been burning in my mind since I started thinking of having, of having you on the podcast. And when you studied journalism, oh, you didn't, you, you studied English, mm-hmm. but you wrote for the paper, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't study journalism? No, no, I didn't. Um, English literature. Okay. So when you went to work for the Oregonian, did you have a certain thing you wanted to write about? Well, I was hired by the Oregonian to write about race and immigration issues. Right. So that's what I want to get at, Angie. And, you know, I, I realize it's great getting that first job, but didn't you think that that was kind of racist to hire you to write about racism? No. I don't know. Did, did, I wasn't did, writing about racism. I was writing about communities of color and immigrants. Okay. Okay. And, I, and, I, okay. Applied, I applied for the job. It wasn't yeah, okay. like. They, okay. Because I, when I first saw that, I said, well, gosh, that's, you know, that's like when these uh, in, you know, when you're in school and they take the African-American kids and say, you're going to be on the basketball team or you're going to play football, you know, and, and I've seen that happen so many times. And I go, are you kidding? Do you not race? Well, journalism hiring work that way, but you What's apply that? for jobs, right? <laughs> it was, I said, you apply for the job. They don't come and find yeah. you. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I was just wondering and I thought, well, yeah, this poor, um, or not poor, but this, this beautiful uh, person came out of college. She had these, all these high hopes and went to this uh, newspaper and they said, yeah, um, you're going to write about these issues. Um, and no, I, I, I specifically wanted okay. to, I now am a research expert on representations of race in the media. I teach a class, um, on representations of, uh, race, gender, sexuality in the media. I spend, um, three hours a week, twice a week with, um, a group of undergraduate students, um, having conversations about race, gender, identity, and and I love it. I think it's um, it's it's what I wanted to dedicate my career to. Okay, well, guy, yeah, it's so fantastic, and um, you know, it's th- there's so many things that that you don't think about. And Angie, it's just so nice to sit and you know, um, you know, obviously, I come from the uh, the American culture that you've kind of been talking about, but I don't think that I really fit into that stereotype or whatever, because, uh, you know, as I said, growing up in a pretty homogenous town, anybody knew was, was quite welcome. Um, and so, uh, um, I just, I feel bad and, um, I, I feel bad about people that have, um, these experiences because, you know, I, it has always been my belief that America has always helped other countries, other cultures, um, has always been a very kind, and um and a giving people and um so it it just is is terrible uh to hear about the experiences like your your father felt and and you just so you know to give you a little bit of you know my own experience i live uh near bellevue and redmond and microsoft right and so mm-hmm. i go to the gym and and most of the people there that i work out with are chinese um of chinese descent and um or, or Chinese. I mean, a lot of them don't even speak English. And, um, you know, we share the pool together. 
and, uh, and, and a few of them speak enough English to know that uh, I'm like the fat guy you got to be careful of when he's doing laps in the pool because he, he makes so much, uh, I splash so much. But, you know, we, all, we have this great, uh, this great rapport with each other. And, um, you know, it's so, it's so fun to have that kind of addition to, uh, to our community. So anyway, um, that's, that's my take on it. And, and I've been around the world and I've, I've seen all these different cultures. And um, Angie, I just want to say that I really feel bad that, you know, somebody like you had to have these kinds of experiences in this country. So um, what would you say to, you know, people that, you know, to be more uh, sensitive and is there something that, that we can do or, or say to, to make other people feel uh, more um, accommodated in our country? Um, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a really complicated question. I think we could talk for another hour on this and it looks like our time is, is um, coming to a close. So there's no short answer for that, but I would say for most communities of color, I don't think that there's a feeling that, um, you know, something terrible happened to us. I think there's a feeling that we've been bonded by an experience where, um, we've lived within a dominant culture and had something that we shared among ourselves that was very rich and very, um, um, very defining for us. And we were also defined by um, a constant awareness that we were different. And that awareness is not always in the form of rampant discrimination or in negativity. It's um, for a lot of us, it's, um, you know, it, it's part of who we are. And so I don't, um, you know, I, I, I don't, certainly a lot of discrimination that has happened in this country is terrible, but, um, but I don't see it as always a, a completely negative experience if we're not talking about things like violence or, or um, protected class discrimination or just, you know, just kind of a feeling of knowing that you were different or being treated differently, I think for most of us was um, something that shaped our personalities and our writing and our choice of careers. And that's, that's not always a bad thing. Okay. Can I ask you one more question? Because as you talk, I keep getting these other okay, questions. I do, I do have to, um, I'm i uh, I've got another appointment. So I do. All right. All right. I'll, I'll take the last you. question, but I've got to get to the other appointment. No, I'm not going to ask you because it's too long to, uh, to address, and we'll just have to have you back on. So, right. um, Angie, right. I just want to say thank you for being on Books in Hindsight. Uh, we don't want to take uh, any more of your time than we already have. So, Angie is at Angie, A-N-G-I-C-H-U-A-N-G dot com, and um, she is a professor at the University of Colorado, and the book is The Four Words for Home, A Memoir of Two Families. Angie, thanks for being on. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right, and we appreciate it. So for everybody out there, get out and pick up a copy of The Four Words for Home. And for everybody out there, especially you kids, please keep on reading. This has been Books in Hindsight with your host, Matthew Hines. Please join us for our next podcast and look for our archives on iTunes and go to thehindsight.com. That's H-E-I-N-E-S site.com for great books by Matthew Hines and other great authors.